The Salem Witch Trials is a dark period in American history. The idea of witches and being possessed by the devil ran rampant throughout Salem, Massachusetts. This video will consist of three main parts, the origin of witch hunts, the paranoia of the masses, and the trials themselves. Before we talk about the Salem Witch Trials, it needs to be said that witch trials have been going on since the 14th century and lasted until the late 18th century. Witch hunting exploded from the 1580s and 90s and the 1630s and 40s. The Salem Witch Trials took place in the later period of the timeline, from 1692 to 1693. It is important to note that around 75% of the European witch hunts took place in Western Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Northern Italy, and Switzerland. The trials were varied, but it is believed that around 110,000 people were tried for witchcraft, and around 40 to 60,000 were executed for it. The term witch hunt is a bit misleading. At the time, the hunt's main goal was to identify witches, not to chase down people already suspected of witchcraft. The question is, why did these witch hunts start in the first place? Witches were believed to be followers of the devil who had sacrificed their souls in order to make a pact with Satan. Witches are believed to use demons as magical aids. They are also believed to be able to shapeshift into animals and they are able to fly to their secret meeting places to take part in devilish acts. Of course, in modern times, the idea of witches being tied to demons is not the common belief anymore as we know their definition of a witch is too ridiculous to apply to anyone. But that doesn't mean some people didn't practice devil worship at the time. Now that we have a good idea on why people hunted witches, we can look at Salem to see what takes place. To give you guys a bit of background, there were two Salems in the late 17th century. Salem Town was founded in 1626 by Roger Conant. It was a lively port community on Massachusetts Bay, and the town would eventually become modern day Salem. Salem Village was formed in the late 1630s by a group of farmers when they moved from Salem Town. It was the first European settlement in present-day Danvers, Massachusetts, in the area known as the Danvers Highlands. The people of Salem Village were still legally part of Salem, but in the 1660s, they lobbied for independence and succeeded. By 1672, Salem Village was its own separate community of around 500 people, with their own meeting house and minister. Salem Village's independence was one problem solved. Another issue was a rivalry between two dominant families, which managed to split the community apart. The wealthy Porter's family had an excellent connection with the well-off merchants in Salem Town. The Putnam family opposed this. They wanted their village to be self-sustainable. These conflicts of interest led to disputes over property. Through the power of the Putnam family, a Boston merchant named Samuel Paris became the new minister of Salem Village's Congregational Church in 1689. Samuel Paris brought with him his wife and three daughters, his niece and two slaves that were from Barbados, a man named John Indian and a woman named Tatuba. It isn't clear if the slaves with him were from African descent. They could possibly be Native Americans. With Samuel Paris appointed to minister, more problems soon emerged. Paris's Puritan religious views further split Salem Village into factions that were for or against Paris. The British War of France and the American colonies was also in 1689 by King William. The results of the war led to upstate regions such as New York, Nova Scotia, and Quebec damaged. This sent a flux of refugees into the county of Essex and Salem Village. This in effect strained the village on resources adding more fire to the flames on the rivalry with the village's two main families. The tension doesn't stop there. The village was also recovering from a recent smallpox epidemic, and there was still the fear of being attacked by Native Americans. To the religious villagers, all these events happening around the same time must have been unreal, and since they were British colonists, they brought with them the idea of witches, passed down from the era of witch hunts. Knowing this, it is not a surprise that the villagers felt something evil was taking place. In January of 1692, Paris's 9-year-old daughter Betty and his 11-year-old niece Abigail Williams were acting very strange. They both began acting up. This included various spasms and screaming outbursts. Dr. William Griggs, 
having never seen these symptoms before, turned to the older religious teachings and diagnosed the girls of being victims of witchcraft. The question is, why were these young girls acting this way? If we were to look to modern science, we might have an answer. It is possible that the girls might have had a mix of multiple problems, such as Lyme disease and epilepsy. Another possible explanation, and in my opinion, the more likely of the problems, was ergotism, which is when a fungus known as ergot infects bread or cereal made of rye. The side effects of ergot can cause vomiting, hysteria, choking, and hallucinations. The symptoms of the girls was very similar to a case just a couple years before in 1688, where a Boston family thought they were under a witch's spell. The account of the family, as well as the detail of the bewitching, was picked up by Congregational Minister Cotton Mather in his book Memorable Providences Relating to Witchcraft and Possessions. The book was written in 1689, so it is possible that the young girls of Salem Village read the book and acted out. Samuel Paris's job was to find out who bewitched the girls. According to Betty and Abigail, the slave Tatuba, and two other outcasts, Sarah Good, a beggar, and Sarah Osborne, an old woman found guilty of a relationship with his servant, were accused. On March 1st, two magistrates from Salem Town came to the village. They were John Hawthorne and Jonathan Corwin. Their main goal was to ask around the village for answers. The beggar, Sarah Good, proclaimed her innocence, but claimed Osborne was the perpetrator. Sarah Osborne, too, proclaimed her innocence. Tatuba at first claimed her innocence, but maybe seeing that it wasn't going so well, tried to save her own skin and just told them what they wanted to hear. In her three-day testimony, she admitted making a deal with the devil. She claimed a man from Boston made her sign the pact and that she saw the names of Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne in the devil's book. She also said there were seven other names that she wasn't able to read. The judges got their much-needed confession and they also decided to take Tatuba's spectral evidence as a sign there were more witches to be found in the village. As you might have guessed, this caused mass panic throughout Salem Village, even reaching outward to other parts of Massachusetts. Other girls started displaying the same strange symptoms. There were Anne Putnam Jr., Mary Wilcott, and Mercy Lewis. But this time, the accused were not just outsiders, but important members of the village. One of the accused was Martha Corey, a trusted member of the church. If such a prominent person could be involved with witchcraft, anyone could in the villager's eyes. It is also interesting to note that the Putnam family were the accusers in many of the cases for the weeks to come. This adds to the possibility that the family was getting rid of people that stood against their vision of Salem Village. If all the hearings accounted for, the accused were sent to jail. On May 27, 1692, the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Sir William Phipps, took charge and ordered the assembly of an official court of Oyer and Terminer. Oyer meaning to hear and Terminer meaning to decide. The court was to be held in Salem Town. The court was chaired by the colony's lieutenant governor, William Stratton, and seven judges. The accused were not allowed any aid of counsel, and the court approved the use of spectral evidence, in which the victims would claim they were bitten and touched by shape-shifting witches. It also became more convincing when the members acted strange in the courtroom, making the idea of spectral evidence seem more real. While the trials were going on, there were members of the community that thought the trials were being handled wrongly, but they kept it to themselves, as the greatest fear was being accused. When just having a rational thought could get you thrown in jail, but that was nothing compared to what was going to happen next. On June 2nd, a woman by the name of Bridget Bishop, who was accused of witchcraft around 12 years before, was the first to be convicted. On June 10th, she was hanged on what was later to be known as Gallows Hill. The hanging of Bridget Bishop was the spark, as on July 19th, five more were hanged. This included Sarah Good. On August 19th, five more were hanged, one of which was a minister that served in Salem Village from 1680 to 1683. His name was George Burroughs, and he was accused of being the witch's leader. It is interesting because when Burroughs stood at the gallows in his final moments, he was said to have recited the Lord's Prayer perfectly. Apparently, witches weren't able to do that, so it at first cast a doubt on him being guilty, but it soon died down. On September 22nd, eight more people were convicted and were hanged on Gallows Hill. 
This included Martha Corey and her husband Giles. He refused to enter a plea and was sentenced to be tortured to death by being pressed with heavy stones. It took two days before he died. So take your pick. Defend your innocence and be hanged or refuse to take part and be tortured to death. As the trials continued, the paranoia became more and more extreme to the point it spread to other communities such as Charlestown and Boston. Of course, this nonsense had gone long enough that Cotton Mather's father, Increase Mather, an important minister and president of Harvard, condemned spectral evidence. Both Increase and his son thought that this form of evidence could be problematic and could lead to punishing innocent lives. Funny enough, the Mathers did believe in witches, but argued that if witches could take spectral forms of loved ones, they could also take the form of the innocent. It is better that ten suspected witches may escape than one innocent person be condemned. The Salem trials continued to spiral out of control until Governor Phipps' wife, Mary Phipps, was accused of witchcraft. It was then he decided to stop the court of Oyer and Terminer. In May of 1693, Phipps pardoned the rest of the accused witches. In January of 1697, the Massachusetts General Court declared a day of fasting for the horrifying witch trials in Salem Village. In 1702, the trials were recognized as unjust and led to Justice Samuel Sewell to apologize for his play in the trials. In 1706, Anne Putnam Jr. apologized for her accusations. And in 1711, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts pardoned 22 of the 33 convicted and paid $800 to the victims' families. In 1953, Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, retold the events from the trials as a metaphor for the McCarthy communist witch hunts of the 1950s. In 1957, the state of Massachusetts officially apologized for the Salem witch trials, and in 2001, the last 11 people were finally pardoned. The Salem witch trials are a traumatic event in American history, but there is a lot that can be learned from it. It is to show that in a time of great hysteria, people will go to great lengths to find a solution to a problem, even if it means to assume people are guilty without evidence. In a truly free society, we should be seen as innocent until proven guilty. If we choose to ignore this important part of history, there will be terrible consequences, as when you forget, you are doomed to repeat. What do you guys think about the Salem Witch Trials? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, leave a like. It really helps me out. If you haven't already, subscribe for more history content. As for next week's video, I'm thinking about doing the Black Plague. As for the Stonehenge video I mentioned in the last video, I think I'm going to make it a three-part series, as there is a lot to talk about. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.